recording is now started. And uh, what we're talking about this week are strings. String is a basic type in Python. Um, and Python, for the most part, assumes everything is a string unless you tell it otherwise. Um, anything that comes in from an input statement, anything like that, Python is going to assume it's a string. Now, a string is kind of a special type because a string is actually a series of characters. It's not just a single thing. Um, it is called a sequence type, and that's because it's a sequence of characters, one after the other. Now, that sequence has certain properties. And what do I mean by a property? Well, a property is something like the length of a string. So it's not the string itself. It's not the word Lisa or it's not the word dog. It's the fact that dog has three characters and the length of dog is three. So the length would be a property. So sequence types or strings have certain properties. One of those properties is its length. Another one is that every single character in a string has an associated numerical value. This is called an index. And that allows us to kind of get at the pieces of the string that we might want to get at without having to have full string. Okay. Who's not? Uh, Gordon, could you please mute yourself? Thank you. Um, so another property of a string is that every character in a string has a number. That number is called an index. In truth, a string is a form of a list in Python. Now, we won't get to lists for a couple of weeks, but the prop, but the string, because it's a sequence of characters and has an index, is a list. Now, it's a list that can't be changed. Once you've created a string, that string is just that. You cannot insert something into the string. You can create a new string from that string, but you can't actually modify the string itself. And something that cannot be modified is called immutable. So a string is an immutable type in Python. So let's go and do a few examples. And by the way, I'm going to, all of these will be posted on the YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, and we're just going to start with simple string here. Let me make this bigger. So I have a variable called Meister. I know it's a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of the single equal sign is a string called, this is a string. Now, how do I know that on line two, there's something called a string? You can't hear anything? Can anybody hear anything? Okay, so some people can hear things. Thank you. So the people that can't, can you log back out and log back in and see if that, that solves the problem? So I'm going to continue on. And how do I know, how does Python know that this is a string? Well, Python knows that line two has a string because of the quotes. Okay, that's what makes it a valid string. Now those quotes have to be balanced. So that means if I have an opening double quote, I have to have a closing double quote. And without those, Python won't think it's a string. In fact, it'll think it's an error. So if I simply do one thing, and that's remove that closing quote, Python, if I try and run this, 
Python's going to give me an error. It's going to give me an error that doesn't tell me a whole lot, but it's still an error. And it's error while scanning string literal. The problem is it found an opening quote, and it didn't find a closing quote. So when you see something like this, the answer is to close the quote. Now, there's another kind of unbalanced quotes. Because a string can be created with double quotes or single quotes. Python doesn't care. But Python cares that they're balanced. So if I open this with a double quote and close it with, my bad, a single quote, and I try and run it, I'm going to get the exact same problem. It's going to give me the exact same error message. And that's because this is not a balanced string and it is not balanced because it does not open with the same kind of quote that it closes with. So I could easily change this to a single quote Oops. and make it correct or I could change them both back to double quotes. It doesn't matter. As long as they're the same on each side then you have a balanced set of quotes and your string will be correct. So before that I jumped into here, we were talking about index values. And at the, one of the properties of a string is that every character has a corresponding index value. That corresponding index value always starts at zero. There's no way to change it. It always starts at zero. It oftentimes confuses students who have never dealt with lists before that it starts at zero. They say, why doesn't it start at one? I don't have a good explanation for that. I don't know why it doesn't start at one. It starts at zero. And that's where we always have to start. So what do I mean by it starts at zero? Well, this is a string, has a certain number of characters. The first is T, the second is H, Whoops, not if I make that change, it's not. Let's do this again. So the first character is T, the second is H, the third is I, the fourth is S. So that, there is an order to the letters, and that order has a value, and the value starts at zero. So if I debug this, let's just run this through the debugger quick. I have a variable called Meister. It is, it says this is a string. Now here on line four, I have an output statement, a print statement, and I've got this new nomenclature, and it's Meister, and I've got this opening square bracket or left square bracket, a number, and a right square bracket. What am I telling Python to do? What I'm telling Python to do is print out the very first character in my stir. So in this case, it's going to print out a T. Okay, so if I go to the console and I step over, I'm going to get a T. On line 5, I'm saying, okay, Python, output the second character in my stir. Now, I know this is, is a little bit confusing because the first character is always zero, the second character is always one, the third character is always two, and so forth. And you need to get used to this because when you get into the list, it's going to be the same way. So I'm going to step over five, and I get H. And when I step over six, it's looking for the third character, so that's going to be an I. And I'm going to step over 7, and it's going to be the fourth character, and this is an S. So that is what I mean by each character has an index value. I am going in, and I'm picking out an individual character, and I'm printing it out to the screen, and I'm picking it out based on that number. Um, and down here is just a little bit of conversion, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, stop that. So, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, so, let's see. 
string and indexing, we just talked about that. List basics. Because a string is a list, there are properties and there are some basics. Now, this is going into list basics just as an introduction of what a list is. We're going to be basically using the string as a list in this um, in this module except for once, so that's why they've introduced it here. Um, but in general, a list is a container. There are two basic container types. In Python, there's a list and a dictionary. A list is just a list of things. It's just one thing after another. And you'll notice here that the syntax is open square bracket, something, a value of some kind, a comma, another value of some kind. It can be as many values as you want as long as you close it with a square bracket. Um, and that's what you do to create a list. Now, why are they doing this? It's because in one of the labs, you're going to be required to split some stuff out of a list. Um, in a list, you can assign elements. So in a normal list, do I have a list here? Oh, I'm glad you can hear me, Medina. So let's see, do I have a list? Uh, simple list. Okay. So here I have, they're talking about lists. Here I have um, a list, and I have called it prices. So I have a variable called prices. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Yes, everybody in this class is going to get tired of me saying that by the time I stop sometime next week. I have an opening square bracket, and then on the complete opposite side of the list, I have a closing square bracket. Have to be balanced. And inside, I have some elements. I have the string. $1.20. I have the value, the float, $14.99, and an integer, 5. Now, lists have properties, just like strings have properties. One of the properties is the length. And in this module, we're going to introduce a function called len, L-E-N. And len gets you the length of anything you put in, any list you put in to len will get the length. So in this case, I have got my, li my list prices, and I'm actually going to change something here. I'm going to say prices length, e just so it makes it a little easier, equals len prices. So what did I do? What did I just do? Well, what I did was I have called the function len, L-E-N, and I have passed it the list prices. So len takes a list, which could be a string too, and it's going to give me back the number of things in it. So here, I'm just going to change this, and I'm going to say prices length. So here I'm getting the length of a list. Here I'm printing it out, and I'm also doing a type conversion. I'm making it a stir because I want to concatenate it or put it together with the length of prices is. So. Let's debug this really quick. I know we've got a lot to go over tonight. Okay, so that simple list, where is it? Okay. Oops. Is it already in here? Yes. So let's debug this. So here I have a variable called prices. It has three elements in it. It's a list. I want to see what happens when I tell Python using the len function to give me the number of things in prices. So I'm going to, 
Oh, and by the way, before I do that, if you're in PyCharm, you can look at the debugger under variables and you'll see prices. And here I have all the prices and the properties of those prices, including the length. So a list already knows how long it is. And Len is going to give me that three. So I step over. Len prices length is three. I'm going to convert prices length to string so that when it goes out to the console, it says length of prices is three. And then I can do here, I can also get to the individual elements in the prices list by simply accessing them by their position. So this is position zero, this is position one, this is position two. So I'm going to just step over these so we can see them. And then one thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you an index out of bounds issue. One thing that happens a lot of times is that because it has three elements, because prices has one, two, and three elements, a lot of times we fall into the trap of, well, I'm just going to get the last element by saying, give me the third element and using the len to do that. So here what we see is I have prices of Sterlen prices colon plus sterling prices of prices. And this is going to give me, and this is going to be an issue because this part is fine. This right here just says, give me the length of the things that are in prices and change that to a string. That's exactly what that, that sequence of things in Python tells me. I have a list prices. Hey, Python, get me the length and use it as a string. Now, here is where the problem comes in, okay? I'm going to say, I have a list prices. Hey, Python, get me the length of prices. And then, oh, by the way, Python, now that I have the length of prices, get me the element at that number. And the number's too big, because while there are three things in the list of prices, it always is indexed 0, 1, and 2. So when I step over line 12, I'm going to get a nasty error that looks just like this. That nasty error is a list index out of range. It's out of range because this gave me a value of 3, and there is no third index. There's a 0, a 1, and a 2. You know, I've said this one time before, and I'm going to say it a couple more times tonight because this is one of those places where students get really frustrated. So let's keep going. So we've just done lists. You can modify lists. Unlike strings, you can change a list. You can add things to a list. You can insert things to a list. We don't really need to do a lot of that. This. This is just an introduction to it. We're going to do a lot of that in a couple of modules, a couple of, uh, in, in a, a next chapter. Dictionary basics. Dictionaries are the other kinds of sequence. Dictionaries are different because they have a key value pair. Yes. Is there a set limit to a list? No. A list can be as long as the amount of memory you have in your computer. You can have really, really, really long lists. Um, you just want to be able to manage them. So no, there's no limit to the number of elements you can have in a list. A dictionary is the other kind of a sequence. A dictionary looks completely different than a list. A dictionary is what we call key value pairs. Okay? So dictionary elements don't have a number, don't have this magical number that's associated with them that you don't really see but you can use. Dictionaries have um, a, relational, a relational concept with this key value pairs. Let me demonstrate. So 
Where is my simple dictionary? Okay, so here's my simple dictionary. First of all, let's make this bigger. It looks different. Okay, oh, ignore my orange squigglies here. That's just pie charm, pie charm telling me it didn't like the way I formatted it. So here I have a variable called age. It's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Now, on the right-hand side of this single equal sign, we have some new stuff, okay? First of all, we see these curly braces, open and close, curly braces. And inside, instead of having just an element, comma, an element, comma, an element, comma, an element, which we have as a list, we have these First of all, we have these colons, and then we have something before the colon and something after the colon. So what we have are key value pairs. The key is always to the left. The value is always to the right. So in this case, I've just said it's age. And I've got Bob is 28 and Frank is 75. OK, so there's some meaning here that Bob is 28 and Frank is 75. Very nice. How do I get to their age? Well, how I get to their age is by the value. So instead of using a 1, a 2, a 3, I'm going to use Bob to get to his age. And I'm going to use Frank to get to his age. So, and, and it's very similar. I, I have my variable age. I have an open square bracket and a closed square bracket. And inside, I have said I'm going, I want the age for Bob, or I want the value for Bob in the age dictionary. So that's how you do it, OK? But uh, I have one here, yeah, simple dictionary. So I'm just going to roll through this real quick. I have, I'm creating a variable age now because we like PyCharm. I have age, and I can go and I can look at all the properties of age. I have a value Bob, about a value Frank, and a length of two, because I can get the length of the dictionary. If I step over this, I'm going to print age. Now, when I print age, that's all I'm going to get. Looks just like the dictionary, because that's what Python's going to give me. But now I want to get Bob's age. How do I get Bob's age? Well, I get Bob's age by accessing the, the um, age dictionary with the name Bob, with the key Bob. And at that point, I get Bob. Bob's age is 28. Now I want Frank's age. Do the same thing. Hey, age, give me the, give me the value for Frank. And then I have Frank. Now, I can also change things. I want, uh, Frank just had a birthday. And he's now 76. So I can simply change the age of Frank to 76. And if I print age, I'm going to get Frank is 76. And if I print Frank again, I'm going to get 76. Now, I'm not going to spend much more time on dictionaries and lists because you don't need them in this module. You're going to need them in a later module. This is just an introduction. OK, common data types. We have springs, integers, floats, and booleans. We all, those, and integers and floats are the numeric types. Why are we talking about types? Because we're about to talk about converting types. So here are our standard sequence types. So we have a string. Immutable, which is basically an immutable list. We have a list, which you can change. We have a tuple, which I never use. Go ahead and play with the tuples if you want. It's an immutable container with ordered elements. That's all it is. A set is a mutable container with unordered and unique elements. So the difference between a set and a list is that a set cannot have two of the same values in it and a dictionary which they call a mapping type because it has key value pairs. So this is just an additional practice for grade calculations. Type conversions. Type conversions are your friends. 
and you're going to need them throughout this class. Why do you need them throughout this class? Well, because sometimes you want to print out an integer. And Python is just going to do that for you, especially if you're, sp if you're trying to make it look pretty with strings around it. So there are two types of conversions. There's implicit and explicit. Implicit just happens. And implicit happens when you are multiplying or adding an integer and a float. It's always going to end up being float. So that's all they mean by implicit. If there's a simpler type like an int and a more complex type like a float, float wins. Then there is explicit, and you're going to spend a lot of time doing explicit type conversions. Okay? You can change a float or a string to an integer by using the int function. You can change an int or a string to a float if you use the float function. And you can change a string from anything. You can change anything to a string, excuse me, using the stir type converter. They're all functions in Java, and you get them for free. So let's go back. There's my type conversions. Concatenate type conversions. Okay. So this is basically what I've just said. Okay. If we look at my little program here, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. Okay. Maybe I made it a bit big. Let me make it a little smaller. Okay. I have a variable called my end. We know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And on the right-hand side, I have the integer 10. How do I know it's an integer? More importantly, how does Python know it's an integer? Python knows it's an integer because there's no decimal place and no quotes. My float is another variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And it is of type float. How do I know it's a type float? Because it does have a decimal place and it does not have quotes. Whoever just came in, could I please ask you to mute? Um, so explicit type conversions, float and int, um, can happen just by calling the function. So in this case, I want to change my int to a float just for that print statement. And I want to change the float to an int. I'm going to go out here and mute real quick. There we go. Um, and then I can do another explicit type conversion for my int. There's somebody not here. There we go. Um, because this. I'm going to change that in a second and show you the error that you're going to get. And then this is an implicit conversion. 1 plus 1.1 is going to equal 2.1, which means it's gone from being an int plus a float to being a float. So let's run through this real quick. Do I have that? Yeah, there we go. So I have, I'm creating, whoops, nope, that's not what I want to do. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. So I need to get type conversion. There we go. Where is it? I know it's in here. There we are. I really wish it would come up in an alphabetical list sometimes. Okay. So let's go to type conversion. I'm creating a variable called myInt. I can see that in PyCharm. I'm also creating a float. Now, now, the nice thing is that there are no additional properties to these, and you can see that in PyCharm. So now I want to print my int as a float. Okay? So if I look over here in the console, what was 10 is going to be printed out as 10.0, but it's not going to be the actual value isn't changed to a float. It's just the way it's looking in the print statement. And then I'm going to do the same thing for my float. My float is 10.55, but it's going to print out as 10. 
Now, to add, to concatenate a string together, you want to do you want to concatenate a string with an int or a float? You have to change it to a stir. Without that stir, you're going to get an error, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. So here I'm just saying this is not a string. This is an implicit conversion. Now it's 2.1. I'm going to print it out. I've got my val of 10, and I'm going to print out my val divided by 3. So those are just a little bit about type conversion. But now I'm going to do something real quick. I'm going to remove this, okay? So let's go to here. I'm just going to debug it again. Everything's happening the same. I've got a 10.0 and a 10, and now I'm about to print this out. Let's see what happens. What happens is a big nasty error again. What happened? It says, can only concatenate stir, not int to stir. My int is an integer. I've set it as an integer right up here. It's 10. There are no quotes around it. Python will not allow you to print or in any way use the add function, the add, that add sign, that plus sign, to concatenate a string to an integer. You can only concatenate a string to another string, and the way you do that is you use the type conversion. Now, the type conversion doesn't actually make the value of my int a string. It only does it temporarily while you're doing this print statement. So if I run this, I don't get that big nasty error message anymore. So that's type conversion. String formatting. String formatting is something you should get used to. Because, sorry, I needed a, I needed a drink of water. Um, because you're going to have to do it a lot in this class. And if you're working with Python, it becomes very important what your strings look like. There's a function called format. I use it all the time in my daily life. Some people like some of the newer ways of formatting strings. Um, I, uh, I'm an old-fashioned kind of gal when it comes to it. I like to dot format. Um, so the dot format is basically used, can be used on any string. And what you have is you essentially have placeholders. These open and close curly braces are placeholders. And they're only placeholders when they're in a string. And what are they holding a space for? They're holding the space for, the, for a value of a variable. So I want, and this is where you don't have to use format modifiers or type conversion because format will do it for you. Um, so basically it's positional. The first open and close curly brace is associated with the first element, the first argument for the format function. The second curly brace is associated with the second argument for the format function. And it goes that way until you're done with curly braces. You can, you can, it's not just two things you can do. You can do lots of different things. Now, you can also have a different form of positional replacement. You can swap the positions by using numbers in them. So this is um, positional replacement, this is the, the one that I just told you about is inferred positional replacement. So this one explicitly says one, because hat would be in the first place. Sorry, one cat is at the index of one, zero hat because it's at the index of zero, and fat would be two because it's at the index of two. I don't generally use positional replacement. I use inferred positional replacement, but they're both valid. And then you have named replacement, which I don't often do named replacement because it's just not something that I find that useful. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, 
So these are just examples of the format statement and different ways of replacing things. Now, there's format specifiers that go along with this. And the format specifiers can make your code very pretty. And there are lots of different ways to do it. The one way that you're going to need to do it tonight is to print a float with two decimal places after the value. And here is what you do. It's this guy right here. That's what you're going to want to learn to do. So this format specifier would have a dollar sign in front of it, which is just a dollar sign. It's nothing special. Open, curly brace, colon dot to F. So what this says is everything after the colon is the formatter, and then it's going to be two spaces for a float. So after the decimal place, give me two spaces for a float. And that's how you read that. Not, I know it's 938. I'm not going to spend a massive amount of time on how to read these. I would go back and take a look at them and play with them. But understand that for this class, for this week's labs, you're going to need this guy right here. Okay? So when, you're, when they're talking about printing out a float with two decimal places or printing out a dollar with two decimal places afterwards, that's what you need to look at. Um, advanced string formatting. There are all kinds of things you can do with widths and stuff like that. You really don't have to worry about them that much for the labs for this week. Um, they can come in handy if you want to do some formatting for your game then you're going to do that. Um, and this is just fill characters. I'm not going to spend much time on these. String slicing. I'm going to spend a little time on these. Remember how I said you couldn't change a string? You can't change a string. But you can create a string from an existing string. Maybe you only want a part of that string. Maybe you want to add two strings together and get a brand new string. String slicing is taking a chunk out of a string and making a new string out of it. That's all it is. And the way you do that is you just basically give it a start and an end, a start index and an end index. So that's what that start and end there is for. If you read this and you weren't quite sure, start is the, the start index. It doesn't have to be zero. It just has to be a valid index in that string. And the end index can be anything greater than the start index. So in here, you'll see that they would be slicing it 7, 8, and 9. Um, and there are all kinds, and again, I want to go over the labs, so I'm not going to spend a massive amount of time on this. But you do want to play with it, and just remember that the start has to be a valid index inside the string and the end has to be greater than the start and still be within the string. So if I look at 5, 10, I would say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then it's going to start after 5 and it's going to be then six, seven, eight, nine. Wait a minute. Example, Meister or Meister both yield Joe. Raise in the length of the string. Okay. Um, okay. So you can also use um, this other format, and that doesn't mean zero and then two to the left of zero. It means two less than the end. So there are all kinds of ways to read this. Um, definitely go over it and check it out. You will most likely be, I don't think you're slicing strings. You are slicing strings once. So string methods. String methods are really helpful. So you do them on strings. You can change things within a string. Now remember, you can't actually change anything in a string. So anything that modifies a string is going to give you back a new string. 
So it's not really the old string. So let me see what I have. Uh, format, we didn't really do this, but um, if you're looking for an example for formatting, this is what I was talking to you about previously. So if I, I have my float is 2.12345, diff is 3.141715. If I run this, okay, Where's my simple format? And like I said, all of these will be up on the YouTube page with the video. So if I run this, what you'll see is I get here, I get two decimal places. And here, I get three decimal places. You're going to need to understand how to use that format for one of the labs. Um, so here, very interesting, you can find things, you can do a lot of things with strings. For the labs this week, you're going to want to understand count. And I'll show you that. Uh, do I have one with count? Uh, list, split, string, concatenate. I don't think I have one with count. Well, we'll keep going. Um, comparing strings. You can see if one string is the same as another string. You can use the double equal sign. Remember when I always say it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign? Well, a double equal sign is checking to see if two things are the same. Now, we're going to really get into that next week. The reason they're introducing this this week is because they have a lab that you have to understand how to use if statements, which happens next week to get the lab right. I don't think that's right. The school knows I don't think it's right, and I will go over the, the actual solution with you because you shouldn't have to know if statements before they're really taught. So here, they're starting to talk about equality and inequality and if statements. We're going to spend a whole, whole week module on that next week. So. This is just stuff to see, to, to tell you something about your strings, okay? Um, so let's, splitting and joining. You can split a string and you can join a string. You can split a string based on spaces. You can split it based on a separator. You can split it um, if you use a split statement. You will split a, a, a string based on spaces. Or you can add a token. In this case, they use the pound. Let's see, do I have a split? I have a split. So here's an example of what you do when you split a string. Okay? It says this string needs to be split. One, two, three, four. How do I split a string? Well, I give it the variable that's a string, and I tell it to split. In this case, I have to be split is my name of the variable. Now, you'll notice that I now have a variable called splitted on the left-hand side of a single equal sign before to be split. That is because to be split is going to give me back a new, in this case, list. Okay? Because I'm asking it to split it, Python only knows that I want it to be some enumerated thing. And the only thing it knows about, Python knows about, is a list. So it's going to give me back a list of the, spring, of the strings that it has split out. So let's just do this. And I'll show you what I mean. Uh, split. Okay, so I'm going to debug this. I have a string called to be split. I know it's a string. I'm sorry, I know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side is my lovely string. Okay? I'm going to call the split function 
it's I'm going to call it on a string Python it's something Python gives me and I don't have to do anything for it when I step over this I now have this list called slitted the list has 10 elements I can tell it because PyCharm tells me and it is in fact each word and one two three four is an element in a list so each of these are an element in a list this is at zero zero string is at zero one and so forth so that's what split it is so if I step over this where my step over sorry the console is going to show me that instead of this as a string I have a list of strings each element in the list representing a word so that was fine it did it in spaces but what if I wanted to do it what if I wanted to split a social security number um, how would I do that well how I would do that is I would use the split function again but I would give it a token and say this is what I want you to split on don't split on spaces split on something else in this case we're splitting on the dash so if I step over that I go back into my debugger I'm going to close this guy I have the string SSN I have uh, split it into what is it parts where's parts there's parts right up there I've split it into three parts based on a dash and I'm just going to print the parts and you're going to see a list now I can get to the things in that part simply by using it like a list I have an index and I have a variable and I can say hey Python get me the value at the zero index from parts that's how you read that so when I step over first of all I'm going to get the length of parts and by the way here I'm using my favorite dot format and I've got my placeholders the open and close curly braces now I'm on line 15 and I'm going to say parts of 0 is 1 2 3 parts of 1 is 4 5 and parts of 2 is 6 7 8 9 and then I'm going to split a new stir I'm going to create a new string from to be split between 5 and 11 so there's to be split and I'm going to go and I'm going to get the characters between 5 and 11 and that's going to give me string so that splitting it seems a little complex but you really are just taking a knife and slicing things you're either slicing it based on a character like a dash or you're slicing it based on spaces or you're slicing it based on the fact that you're cutting you know you're cutting at five and you're cutting at 11 and you're getting what's in between so that's what splitting is okay you can also join strings sorry you can join um, lists into a string and that's what the join method is about it just says take this string take this list and make it a string and oh by the way put this in between it um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it you don't really use joins in the labs um, if you combine them excuse me uh, it can be very interesting you can do lots of neat string things um, I know so 2.12 lab name format this is an unfair lab okay it expects you to know things about if that about conditionals that you won't learn until next week so what I do for this lab and again the school knows I do it and sometimes some, some teachers get irritated with me and if they get irritated with me you have them come talk to me this is the solution for lab 2.12 and I give you the solution because of this you guys don't know how to do um, 
multi-dimensional list and you don't know how to do branching. So that's why this is going up on the site. I've done it in previous, previous terms. Sometimes people get a little upset with me, but the administration knows that I do this. So basically, you're going to have a user input. And what they want is they want you to take user input. They want you to split it up into a list. And then they want you to, based on the number of inputs, whether it's two or three, they want you to format it. So it be last name, comma, first initial dot, or last name, comma, uh, first name, dot, first initial dot, middle initial. So that's what they want. So, but you guys haven't been introduced yet to multidimensional lists. You also haven't been introduced to branching. So this will be up on the site. Now, 2.13 is counting characters. Remember I said that count function was going to be important? This is where it's going to be important. So it says write a program whose input is a string which contains a character and a phrase and whose output indicates the number of times a character appears in the phrase. That is what we use count for. So here we have a little bit of Python that is similar to but not 100% 100% of what 3 would be. So I have here you'll see me using count for first word. So I have a string, okay? And I have I've put n and then my name is Lisa blah blah blah. So I'm going to let me make this bigger. My apologies. I'm going to get the first word out of my stir, and then I'm going to get the remainder. Okay, I want everything after that first word. So to do that, I use the split, the ability to split, which is what I'm doing here, everything after the first word. And then I'm going to print it out using the count method. So let's go through this real quick. This is similar. Uh, or okay. So we're going to debug this real quick. I have Meister. I know it's a string. I know it's a Meister is a variable because it's on the left hand side of a single equal sign. Are you guys completely sick of hearing that? So what am I going to do? First, I'm going to get the very first word out of my stir. Or in this case, I apologize. I'm going to get the first character. Zero is only going to get me a character. I'm going to change this. Um, and that character is going to be an N. Okay? If I look at the console and I step over, first word is an N. So now the next thing I need to do is I need to get everything after the end. So what this does, it says um, after, get me everything after the very first character. Okay, starting at one to the end, because remember, zero is the first character. So starting at one, which is the second character, to the end, get me everything out. So I do that. If I go to the debugger, remainder is everything other than that n, which is exactly what I wanted. So now I'm going to print. I've got a nice little format. I've got a nice little um, placeholder there. Exists in another placeholder, space another placeholder, times. So I'm going to have the value of first word. It's going to go right here exists in remainder, it's going to go right here, and then this one is going to be remainder.count first word. So the remainder is everything except the first character, count says get me the number, and first word is, in this case, the first character. Sorry, I named it word. And so that's what's going to be printed out. 
So I'm going to say N exists in my name is Lisa, my dog's name is Spot, two times. And that's correct. So this is similar what you're going to have to do to lab 2.13, okay? You're going to have to use count. You're going to have to split your input. You're going to have to get the first character out of the input. And you're going to have to get the remainder from the input, everything after that first character. Lab 2.14, creating passwords. This is all about adding strings together. So you're going to take um, two words and a number. And by the way, there is um, there's a YouTube video out there on this one on my channel. So it actually goes through everything that you need to do. You're going to take three inputs. And what you're going to do is you're going to use, first you're going to um, output what they input. Then you're going to use that input to create different passwords. So if I say similar to 2.14, what you'll see is I have two words, A, B, C, D, E. Word two is F, G, H, I, J. The number is 42. I'm going to tell them what they entered. Okay. And remember, I'm using my favorite format thing here. Placeholders, three placeholders, and then the variables. Okay. I'm going to create password. And that's going to be, I'm going to use my format specifier here to create a password by just putting them next to each other. And then I'm going to say the length of the password. So let's do this one real quick. And I'll also put the, U the link to the YouTube video that I did just about this one um, in the um, description. So 2.14. And I'm going to debug it. Nope. I just ran it, didn't I? Yeah. So if you entered A, B, C, D, E, and then it added the two together. Let's do this real quick. Okay. So I have three variables. The first thing's going to happen is I'm telling them what they entered. The second thing is I'm just adding them all together and I'm going to print it out, and then I'm going to print out the length. So that's similar to what you would have to do. Now, one other thing I wanted to say, uh, I got some comments last week about uh, kind of not doing the challenges. I do have some code in there to help you with the challenges, but understand that according to the rubric, you are not required to do the challenges in Zybook. I highly encourage you to do the challenges in Zybooks. But doing the challenges does not affect your grade. Okay? You have to do the labs and you have to do all the participation activities. You do not have to do the challenges. They are not part of the grade. So that's one of the reasons I don't concentrate on the challenges a lot because they're not part of your grade. Do them if you want the experience. Um, but you don't have to do them. So does anyone have any questions? Going once. Going twice. Okay. So next week we will be doing Module 3. And before you come to the lecture, make sure you go over the section associated with pseudocode. Because starting next week, because we know pseudocode, I will, be, I will be presenting and putting up on the YouTube page with the video the pseudocode associated with the labs. So you need to understand pseudocode. And when I go over it, I'm going to go over the pseudocode next week. So 
please have looked at that before you come to class if you want to get the most out of it. So I'm going to say good night. I hope that you all have a good week, and I should have this up on. Um, yes, let me give you a real quick link to the YouTube page. Um, actually, let me just do this. So I get you the right one. So for those who want it, there is the link to the YouTube channel. And if you go to the videos, there is, where is it? Where is it? It's here. It's there. Um, oh, no, that's not 2.14. Anyway, so there's the link to the YouTube video. You, everybody, I hope, have a very good evening, and I'm going to end the call now.